Tales of the Otherworld, of elves, fairies, and other fantastic beings who come from a land next to, but veiled from our own, dominate Northern European myth, legend, and folklore. Such stories are so common and widespread that Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm once declared in an essay that fairy lore had been part of a mythic system that had dominated Europe until the advent of Christianity. Even then, it carried on through folklore and folkways through the centuries, even spawning a sort of fairy mania in the Victorian era. We often dismiss tales like these as being the products of mere flights of fancy, belonging to a bygone age that was prone to belief and superstition. But one story in particular from the lowlands of Scotland stands out. It involves a man who actually existed and who retained a major part in Scottish history and legend for centuries. A poet who was given the gift of prophecy after he was visited by the Queen of Elfland and spent seven years in her kingdom. Today on Totally Awesome History, Thomas the Rhymer. True Thomas, or Thomas Rhymer of Erkeldoon, hailed from a small village near the modern town of Earlston on the Scottish border. He was named thusly for his gift of verse and prophecy, and that he was given the power of a tongue that could never lie by the Queen of the Elves, that fair Lady Fay, whose beauty would besought any who laid eyes upon her and dared to kiss her lips. His name was very well known and respected from the 14th to the 19th century in Scotland, especially among the common people. In fact, it was common for farmhouses to have copies of his prophecies right up until the end of the 19th century. What's more, noblemen and even royalty would often attach his name to prophecies that conveniently favored their cause in order to lend them legitimacy. But who was he? His name appears on two surviving documents from the 13th century. One, where he is listed as an eyewitness to a deed wherein a certain Petrus of Haga of Bemerside promises that he and his heirs will pay half a stone of wax each year to the abbot and convent of Melrose. And another, from 1294, supposedly written by Thomas's son, wherein his son is selling the inheritance that his father left him. Little else is known about him apart from the romance and ballads that contain his prophecies, and more interestingly, how he got his prophetic gifts. We can certainly infer, however, that when he was alive, he must have been a man of remarkable character and deeds. In 1286, it is said that he predicted the death of Alexander III, and less than 30 years after Thomas's death, we have one of his prophecies recorded in a manuscript which is dated to around 1320. It's easy to imagine that there would have been more, but alas, such is the nature of history. He is also mentioned, along with other soothsayers, in the Scala Chronica, a French document chronicling English history and begun in 1355. Indeed, his prophecy spans centuries and included such predictions as the Scottish victory at Bannockburn in 1314 and the succession of Robert the Bruce to the Scottish throne, the defeat of the Scottish King James IV at Flodden at the hands of the English in 1513, and the defeat of Mary, Queen of Scots forces at the Battle of Pinkie in 1547, the last pitched battle to be fought between Scotland and England. But it's the story of how he won the nickname True Thomas that makes his own story sparkle. The story of Thomas's meeting with the Queen of Elfland comes to us from two sources. The first is a medieval romance titled Thomas of Erkeldoon, which was written as early as 1401. The second coming out of the oral tradition, was a ballad that was sung through the centuries and first recorded in written form in Sir Walter Scott's Minstrelsy of the Scottish Borders. Some see the ballads as coming out of the romance, whereas others see the romance as coming out of the oral tradition that also created the ballads, only written down and slightly altered by the late medieval writer who wrote the romance. All of them, however, bear striking similarities having their differences only in minor details and motifs. And though the romance in some versions of the ballad include a second and third part called Fits that outline Thomas's prophecies, these are thought by many to have been added on to an older, simpler story of Thomas's meeting with the Queen of Elfland. Some have even suggested that this original story was even composed by Thomas himself. What's also interesting is that this older, 
horror story was believed by the ballad singers who carried it on through the centuries to be absolutely historically true. And so it goes. Let me tell you the tale of true Thomas Reimer of Erkel Down. True Thomas lay on Huntley Bank, a fairly spied with his eye. And there he saw a lady bright come riding down by the elden tree. A splendid lady was she, atop her milk-white steed, dressed in the grass-green skirt and a mantle of velvet fine. True Thomas, he pulled off his cap and lighted low down to his knee. All hail thou mighty queen of heaven, for thy peer on earth I never did see. Oh, no, no, Thomas, she said, that name does not belong to me. I am but the queen of fair Elfland, that am hither come to visit thee. Harp and carp, Thomas, said she, come along with me, and if ye dare to kiss my lips, your body will surely be mine. Though the good and bad shall happen to me, never such a dare shall me deter, said he. And so he kissed her rosy lips there beneath the elden tree. Now you'll come with me, she said, true Thomas, and serve me seven years, through times good or bad, whatever chance decrees. She mounted her steed with true Thomas behind, and rode swifter than the wind. Farther and farther until they passed through water, that some say was blood. For it is said that the blood that shed on earth runs through that far country. Forty days and forty nights they strode through, near to see the sun nor moon only hear the roaring of the seas. Until they reached the garden and left the living land behind. Thomas reached for some fruit, but his lady did forbid. Eat that fruit, said she, and you'll surely wind up dead. Eat this bread and drink this wine, and when you've finished that, lay your head on this lap of mine, and I'll show you a family story. Oh, see not yon narrow road, so thick beset with thorns and briars. That is the path of righteousness, though after it but few inquires. And see not that bread, bread road that lies across that lily living. That is the path of wickedness, though some call it the road to heaven. And see not ye that bonny road that winds about the ferny bray. That is the road to fair elf land, where thou and I this night man guy. But Thomas, ye man hold your tongue, whatever ye may hear or see, for if ye speak word in Elfinland, ye'll ne'er get back to your own country. Ye mustn't speak to prince or peer, nor ask grace from any lady's fear. Hold thy peace, for as I say, so it must be. And when they arrived at her courtly fair, though they asked him many questions, such a well-bred man was he, that he only spoke to his fair lady. And thus, he has gotten a coat of the even cloth and a pair of shoes of velvet green until seven years were gone and passed through Thomas on earth was ne'er seen. On his return to earth, he was given the second sight and a tongue that could never lie and told many things that shall come to pass by his queenly love. And this is why we call him True Thomas. And that's the story, such as we have it devoid of obvious religious motifs, such as where in the romance we have the Queen of Elfland sending Thomas back to the mortal world because she's afraid that the devil, who has come to collect a tithe, will take Thomas as his price. On the other hand, in the romance, we have Thomas thinking that he has only spent three days in Elfland, whereas in the real world, seven years have passed. Such time differentials are actually quite common to tales of visits to that other country. That said, at least one scholar has seen in this story an inversion of the grand biblical story, crossing back across the Red Sea into the Garden of Eden, and this time the woman stopping the man from eating the forbidden fruit. Conversely, the story bears an interesting cosmology that isn't quite Christian in nature. Rather than the binary concept of heaven and hell as Christianity would have it, there is a third option, Elfland, where it is a woman, a queen who rules, where wonders abound, conventional morality with regard to love and we can assume sex is upended. 
Frustratingly, we're not told much information about what Thomas might have seen or experienced while in Elfland, though it wasn't uncommon for visitors to such other worlds to be forbidden from talking about what they had seen. What we can be sure of, though, is that at every point, the story's Celtic fairy lore bleeds through. Certainly, the way to the Celtic Otherworld was either over a great body of water or beneath hills, as with the Irish She. It's also well known in fairy lore that mortals must neither eat nor drink the food offered there, or they could never return to their own world. And the Ilden Hills, where Thomas met the Queen, are believed by some to have been their entry point and have long been associated with fey activity since ancient times. Some legends even state that King Arthur sleeps beneath them. As mentioned before, the ballad singers who told this story through the centuries believed it to be absolutely true. One ballad collector, William Motherwell, even warned others in his 1827 Minstrelsy Ancient and Modern that if they expressed too much doubt and skepticism, the singers would clam up. Earlier in the century, Sir Walter Scott, a normally logical man, eventually became convinced that there was some trace of truth to the locals' belief in fairies. Even more, Alan Cunningham, one of Scott's friends and author of Traditional Tales of the English and Scottish Peasantry, remarked that in 1828, the people of Scotland had decidedly not lost their fairy faith. And Charlotte Bronte, author of Jane Eyre, believed in fairies and moreover that the 19th century industrialization of England was causing the fae folk to leave. And though we may scoff at such stories and call them fairy tales, pun fully intended, we also have very little problem with talking about the possibility of other dimensions or multiple worlds, alien abductions, astral travel, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, where in the case of those, people say that they have gone to another world and often they come back with gifts that they cannot explain. Could it be that stories such as Thomas the Rhymer's of visits to the other world where supernatural beings live be merely earlier descriptions of such phenomena? Thomas's influence throughout history is one that certainly gives us pause and reason for wonder. Today, if you visit the town of Earlston, you can visit what remains of what's called Rhymer's Tower, where Thomas is thought to have lived. There's also the Rhymer Stone in the Elden Hills near Melrose, supposedly marking the spot where Thomas met the Elven Queen. As for Thomas, no one knows what happened to him. According to Sir Walter Scott, popular tradition held it that one night while entertaining at the Tower of Erkeldoon, someone came running in and told Thomas that a heart and hind were parading through the streets. Thomas at once arose and left, following them into the forest, returning with them to Elfland and to his queen. Whatever the case, his name would eclipse even that of the great Merlin in the Scottish borderlands in the respect that it commanded. We obviously can't say for certain how Thomas got the gifts he's said to have had. People have believed a lot of things throughout history, and no doubt people in the future will look back at things that we believe with amusement. But the story of Thomas the Rhymer is something special. When we approach it with an open mind and a little bit of imagination, it causes us to wonder, what if? And for that reason, Thomas the Rhymer, or true Thomas of Erkel Dune, is part of totally awesome history. Mm -hmm.